All right, good morning. I call to order the audit committee meeting for Conroe Independent School District. It is 7.30 a.m. on May the 12th, 2021. First item on our agenda is citizens' participation. For anyone who is registered, you'll be allowed to address the board only on the items posted on this agenda in accordance with board policy BED. Is there anyone that wishes to address the board? All right, we will consider that item closed. Item two is to consider approval of the minutes of the March 10th, 2021 Audit Committee meeting. Those were sent out in our board book packet. I assume everyone has read through those minutes. Is there a motion to approve or is there any edits? Move approval is presented. Thank you. Second the motion. Thank you. All those in favor? All those opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. All right, item three is to review the internal audit work plan and schedule of work completed to date for fiscal year 2021. Mr. Hayden. Chairman Sanders, members of the audit committee, Dr. Noll, good morning. Welcome to the last audit committee meeting of the school year. Um, it's been a busy time for internal audit. We'll get right to it here. You just thought you were going to get right to it. <laughs> I'll just advance it for you. Okay. in rehearsal. Yeah. All right, now try it again. Oh, okay. There, there we go. go. For activity funds, we completed Grand Oaks. We've got uh, Caney Creek and Cox Intermediate in progress. And you see we've got three left to, to finish over the summer, so we are proceeding well on those. Any questions on activity funds? All right, the operational audits, uh, the Flex 20 construction audit. Um, Easy and his team do a fantastic job of controlling costs, of tracking costs. I'm really impressed. I've got 20 years of experience, and it's one of the best control environments that I've seen for that, that, that kind of money. So we didn't have any findings. and in, in fact, uh, the last two observations that we had from the previous, from Flex 19, were addressed. Um, so, and they adopted this great um, project mates uh, platform. So, internal audit was able just to go in and pull vendor receipts and invoices, and kind of everything was right there. Really made it a lot more simple to do, and we definitely will not need outside help to do these anymore. These will all be internal now, so. Oh, nice. Any questions on the Flex 20? Mm -hmm. All right, PEAMS follow up. This was an audit that we did for the 2019-20 uh, school year. Um, so we, you know, there were enough issues <coughs> that we came back and, and did a formal follow up. And you can see the numbers, they haven't really changed a lot since the first one. There's still um, a lot of inconsistencies uh, between the schools. There, for internal audit, the biggest issue is just the, the missed attendance, not so much the late. They're an hour late. Well, they're not supposed to be, but it's more the you didn't take attendance at all. I, I recall uh, in PEAMS years ago, they used to have periodic, maybe quarterly or bi-monthly meetings, do they still, is that still a process? Yeah, they do their audits, they bring all their, right. it's a And so, in. is that the place that these types of errors could be found, should be found? I'm just asking. Yeah, I mean, the PEAMS uh, department is, one, one of our suggestions was that they just pull up the information on the schools that they do quarterly and and share that with everybody, and they're doing that. I just don't know if that information is being really looked at at the school level. I think the, tr truthfully, I think part of the struggle this year is attendance is one of the things that's right. almost impossible in the COVID environment because a kid with is virtual. not here, but they can, if they don't enter the school today, they can log in at home. And so um, this can be something that we can really focus on moving into next year because our environment will be very different as far as attendance goes because if they're virtual they're going to be a different campus not not um, not in their home school so I think we can, can continue to make improvement I do think this is a very challenging year to see growth in this area because it's 
That's a good uh, point to make. Challenge. The, the virtual students versus the mm -hmm. in person. I can see that. Dr. Hines? And I'll just mention that you know, we are working on that. Our assistant superintendents are also addressing that to their meeting with the principals. But to echo what Dr. Hill shared, I think this year, A, our attendance for teachers has not been great. We're having to send people home for 14 and we're isolating them. And so substitutes can't take attendance at the regular time. We're working on that. And obviously, the environment this year has been very challenging. Plus, We did take all the virtual teachers out of those numbers. Mm. So just right, right. But you still could have, yeah, but still every, have the students, students right. Right. right? Every teacher could have a virtual kid though, right. 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 isolated right. or quarantined right. on a given day. Okay. So, hey, hey. Oh. go ahead. Sorry. You mentioned these um, these air rates are consistent with what you found before. Yeah. So they're they they were pretty much in line with what we had in 2019, 2020. So is the plan then to do another follow-up next year? Yes. We will continue to follow up on this. Just like the band instruments. I mean, right. that's going to be one of the ongoing uh -huh. um, follow-ups the internal audit does annually. One of the things that I'd like to just know is if we have a process in place where the district level teams is working with the local campus and they're meeting and doing their audits, is that process effective or not? Because it seems to me that that's one of the controls in place in that control environment. And if that process is failing us, then, then we, need to, we need to make some sort of changes uh, to that. So I just don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, and I think that next year, as they say, when, when we do this again, we'll have a better picture okay. of what it looks like in a normal and environment. I, okay. And I do think this challenge is probably more on the plate of the principal and the teacher than it is on the team's clerk themselves. Okay. You know, I think they can only they, do what they can do. I understand. That, that's the, yeah, I, I I, they can't fix it. It's I, the principal, ultimately. I got it. The teacher's the ones that have to take it. So I think it. You got it. You know, they, they just are reporting results. Right. But I think we have to fix it on the other side of that. Okay. Also. All right. That's, that's, that's perfectly acceptable. Okay. All right. Any other questions on teams? Just one more thing. Um, next year, we all are doing a follow-up on this. Could you keep an eye on any schools that are doing it well, right? So maybe there's some best practices we can share with some of the other campuses. Okay. Yeah. That's a great thought. That is a good thought. Thank you. Band instruments. Um, as you all know, Internal Audit's been working closely with Dr. Horton, and um, they have, he has issued the final inventory guidance, and you should have a copy of that guidance. Um, it's just, you know, high level. It, it uh, covers the head director responsibilities, you know, issuing instruments, the intra-school movement of instruments, checkout policies, and, and most important, the annual <coughs> inventory process and guidelines. And... As I said earlier, internal audit will be there. We, one of the things I'm most proud of in the last couple of years of internal audit is we really have forged partnerships with the people that we've been auditing. I think Easy would agree, and I know Dr. Horton would. We're independent, but we're also a partner working to help improve things. And we will continue to do that with the band instruments going forward. I think that's a good way of approaching internal audit on any level is to be a partner, although like you said, you have to be independent as far as trying to present uh, audits and findings and observations, but part of your role, like Ms. Chase was saying, is to provide them with best practices mm -hmm. and with, with ways to improve. Uh, it's not just a gotcha kind of department, it's more of a here, I'm, I'm truly here to help. And while some may or may not believe that, I, I think that if you approach it with that type of an attitude and that you're going to get a lot of cooperation, 
and ultimately the district wins, which I think is the, the best result possible. Well, I mean, internal audit worked with Dr. Horton on these policies, and um, you know, he doesn't hesitate to reach out to us, and I don't hesitate to reach out to him. Um, and it's been a excellent collaboration, and we've actually gotten a lot of work done Good. since the original band audit. Good. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm proud of that. I do have a question about the procedures that y'all okay. y'all outlined here. When do you we want saw Dr. Horton, yeah, either one, yeah, maybe maybe a Dr. Horton question. Good morning. Um, Good morning. One of the comments that I had submitted when we saw the original draft was about this added level of oversight of the campus principal involved yes. in there. Um, and I, I see that that's still in there on the inventory. Can you kind of explain the thought process of having them involved? Because and, and I'm not putting our principals down in sure. any way, but to my knowledge, none of them are former band directors. And, you know, they're not necessarily going to know the difference in a a mellophone that needs repair or one that's ready. To, they're just going to kind of have to take the band director's word yes. for this. I, I think they're, thank you, Mr. Moore. There, I, may I? Yes. For clarity. <laughs> uh, I think there are two, I think there are two things, uh, just a little bit of context. You know, the first three pages of this document um, vet some, uh, have, are, contain some vetted um, expectations that have never been formalized before. And so I'm very glad of that. So the outgrowth of that is the, the so what do we do about it factor. And I think the last two pages of the document as I printed them have the step-by-step um, the -step procedures mm -hmm. and then the verification. Um, at the step-by-step -step procedure part, um, the expectation is, and, and this is where internal audit comes back in, is that um, they've been to the campuses, they've seen, they've physically seen the instruments so that's the fail safe as opposed to the principal having to go in and go now is that a piccolo or a flute right so um so we're we're partnering with them with my office with uh, mr hayden's office so that the burden of of accountability is not on the principal to identify the instrument it's on the principal to say i trust that the inventory as presented kind of like a textbook inventory they, they don't go through and count every textbook as a principal but uh, that they verify that the procedures have been followed. They verify that the, um, the inventory as currently accurate in, in the CHARMS database management system and the printed backup are both when they are submitted and signed off by the director and all the directors at the campus. Uh, the principal signature verifies that they are also in agreement that they believe that that has all been vetted. Is that? Yeah, it, it, oh, absolutely. Okay, good. I, I, just, I just didn't want to hold yeah, we're not Dr. Smith count. accountable if, yes. no. if the inventory says there's 19 sousaphones and there's only 18. No, sir. That, I don't, I, I, and I appreciate that opportunity and, to clarify. And I don't think that was ever the no. original intent. Part of it, too, I think, is it's a protection for the principal. I can speak as a former principal. You know, you're responsible for everything on the campus as the principal. And this is a big deal. And so if, if I'm going to be held responsible as the principal for making sure that the inventory is done properly, I want to be in the loop. I want to be in the. I don't want to be counting piccolos because I couldn't right. pick one out. Uh, but but I do want to know that the process is done, and I want to be able to have that conversation with a band director and say, "You did it," and that's that, that's that the point. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Did, did we also? I remember a conversation about also requiring the inventory before there could be any additional purchases of. New we, band instruments? Yes, sir. We have we have not moved forward with any capital outlay on any instrument purchases yet this year, okay. as we have been solidifying that inventory audit. Okay. Uh, to be to be completely honest with you, the page I'm most excited about is a timeline, mm -hmm. and the reason I'm excited about a timeline, if I could for just a moment, is that first of all, it's it's been vetted. I've shared it with the band directors, they and the orchestra directors. They've all seen the document. They know what the expectations are. But if you'll notice, and, and I'd like to just highlight one specific um, element that it's embedded in here, but I want to make sure that it's overtly pointed out. Um, in the very middle of the page that says, after all the above steps are complete, they have, they have literally never had a step-by-step -step process for band or orchestra of how to accurately and systematically go through what they do at the end of the year. And then you see the other italicized statement right that right below that, before any instruments are issued to students, because you know, in practice, 
at the end of the year, they're actually starting at the high school level, the beginning of marching band, the beginning of summer band, things like that, that where they want to get instruments back in kids' hands that are in good shape. But now we have an actual if-then statement following chain so that we know that we have a vetted procedure and they literally have to go into charms, close out the inventory for the year. It's, it's a manual process. And that verification is part of that manual process. So as they go in, close out the year, they can't issue anything until the new year has begun. And the new year can begin May 15th if they have completed all steps. So we're not restricting them to a drop dead date of when it must happen so much as a window of time for their campus as to by this point it should have happened and when it is complete then you can move forward with the meeting the needs of your campus does that does that seem to be yes more along the lines of what so so that's Based a very long answer to your question we haven't bought anything for right. going forward yet okay okay, okay. And, and has that been how's how's this change in process been received um well, <laughs> I'll answer that in two ways. By the band directors, they have all said, okay, we get it. We know this is a big deal and we must, I mean, informally and formally, they've, they've received this very well um, at the high school and junior high level. Um, I think many of them were glad for a, a formalized process to be able to be accountable. Um, I think the natural filtration of that, of that information to the orchestra directors, uh, Mr. Hayden could share the orchestra audit was, just near perfect. Oh. Um, so because it came later and it's a smaller number and they collaborate with their colleagues, I think they all knew that there was a much higher standard of accountability than they had ever mm -hmm. seen or received. And they know that, as, as you mentioned about the partnership and going forward, and Mr. Hayden mentioned, that this is now what we do, not we do this because. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's the standard as opposed to a reaction. Right. Is that... Absolutely, that's, that's what okay. I was looking for. Just for my knowledge, elementary music instruments are not part of this. We're not, we're not expecting no. a, an elementary teacher to be turning in an, an, an inventory of how many marimbas and how many boom whackers. Xylophones and boom yeah. No, sir. In fact, um, we actually had a, a philosophical discussion in, in specifically in the string instrument world about bows, like cello bows, violin bows, viola bows because um, they have a much shorter lifespan than an instrument because of the nature of what they are and how they're used. And so I think our threshold of inclusion in inventory is anything that would be considered a capital outlay item that we've purchased with local funding. And um, that would be primarily related to instruments. Should I tell you about the next phase real quick? Like we're, we're gonna be doing pianos next year because we believe that we have somewhere between three and four hundred pianos in the school district so those are not able to be liquefied as assets like band and orchestra instruments are you can't really take a piano to a pawn shop but uh but at the same time they're a, an expensive item and a capital outlay item so we want to make certain that we have a very um, established procedure of knowing what we have and how we're maintaining it because that would probably represent a significant amount of money as well. I would think the maintenance of those pianos. The, the maintenance and upkeep right. of those is also a procedural thing that we have in place, but we also need, with staff turnover, mm -hmm. honestly, we have about two-thirds of our fine arts staff are new in the last five years. Wow. So because of that, there's a, a, an ongoing professional development aspect of it that's procedural, let alone instructional. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Thank you. I've got a couple questions, Dr. Oh. Horton. Yes, sir. Uh, on the... Inventory step in, steps and timeline. Uh, number three, a deposit must be collected for each student-owned instrument checked out by a student. Yes, sir. Is that, um, is, is there a sliding scale for the students for the particular prod, uh, instrument they're checking out and also it, is it tied to their ability to pay it or who can pay it? Tell, Thank you for asking that, that, Mr. Hubert. The, the actual answer is it's really, it's not a sliding scale, it's a binary yes or no. If, if they can't afford it and they cannot uh, pay it, then we have never held a student um, accountable for being able to, um, if you can't pay the instrument, it's really a, a deposit for a cleaning fee. 
or a repair fee, and I'll go into that in just a moment. But we've never, uh, at the campus or district level, told a student that they could not play an instrument because they couldn't pay the deposit. So okay. we have not um, we have not established any policy that says that that you would be able to do that. In almost every campus uh, situation that I've been involved in over the last almost six years, um, that's a conversation between director, principal, and parent to make certain that that access is there and able to be provided. Um, we also know that when you're a percussionist and you are one of four people playing a set of drums, a new set of drum heads, uh, over a year's period of time doesn't come close to the $75 um, instrument repair fee that that they are asked to contribute. Um, a chemical clean on a tuba right now is $190. So if you're using a school-owned tuba, we're not expecting it as a one-to-one -one, uh, cost recovery measure. It's more of a skin in the game type sure. <clears throat> thing. Does that help answer that? that? Is the, well, that's what I was I obviously figured. That's probably what it was. It's just some kind of accountability measure. Yes, and, sir. And financially, mm -hmm. certainly motivates me. I would say it probably <coughs> motivates most people as well. I just, I wanted to make sure I heard you say no kid was going to be held back from yes, being able to rent a, 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 an instrument out because they couldn't financially come up with the money. Is that, when you talk about um, the cleaning fees, do, do, do the bands have partnerships with, um, with um, what are they called, like the, the clubs to help pay for that stuff? Or does that come out of the sure. band budget? So, the, so actually, it's uh, it, it's really the the current funding mechanism. And please, if I say this wrong, y'all stop me. But um, is that, for instance, let's say that a a, a program has a hundred students using school owned instruments, okay. and so that would be in theory seventy five hundred dollars that that instrument sure. repair fee is into their account at the school. So they, as invoices come through for repair or things like that, um, they, they deplete that amount first. And when they get to the end of, the, and it goes into the, the activity fund at the school, I believe, or the general budget fund, they, they track it back through um, the, the campus level. When they've exhausted those funds and there are still needs, then the campus secretary sends... Um, the excess repair or replacement or, or cleaning or whatever it might be to um, the finance office and copies me for approval so that we can have another fail safe to make sure that they have used all of their money prior to us funding what we need to additionally either repair or clean or, or whatever we need to do for the instrument. So the, so it's it's a deposit that goes in so they're getting that money back it's in terms of a deposit it's not a security deposit where you as a student get that money back it's actually um, I think we call it an instrument repair fee okay. that's that's fine yes sir and then and, I, my yeah that answers my question okay. yeah, I just want to make sure it, if there is a cleaning fee the kids are helping pay for that as well yes sir it's not going back to them as a, as I would think a deposit in result after everything is said and done and I'm glad we're doing this do you expect there to be what are your expectations after we do this inventory? Do you think we'll have an increase in, in more students participating in band because there's more instruments that we have found or financially an impact with, because we're not having to purchase? What, what do you guys think the impact will be to the students for this? I, I, think it's, I think it's multiple potential points of contact. One of them is I think we're going to actually know what we have and we, the next step would be to assess the condition. And there, there's an actual formula for depreciation of instruments, which we have not gotten to because um, depreciation <coughs> over time may or may not result in replacement value. So if, if you lose a, an $8,000 tuba and it was only worth $1,500 after 20 years, you still have to buy another $8,000 tuba, which I think is the is the premise from which this started. Um, so I think first and foremost, we'll know what we have. And I think the second part of that is we'll be able to assess based on enrollment trends where we need to go. So there's a little bit of a potential regression analysis available to us. Like if we see a program continually growing in enrollment, but the instrument inventory remaining static, 
especially at our higher SES campuses, I think we can predict where we need to allocate resources better, which has always been anecdotal and reactive. It's never been able to be forecast or, or proactive. Okay. So I think knowing what we have, and then we're also working on enrollment trends and enrollment projections right now so that we can see where we are and what we need, because as our campuses grow, typically our instrumental programs grow at a commensurate rate that is anywhere from 8 to 15 percent of the campus, depending on the campus. So at that point, um, we also were looking at, um, are we going to be able to keep up with the inventory we have to be able to give kids access? So I think it's knowing what we have and knowing where we're going. I would like to believe that the the other result of that is we'll never have a student or parent say, well, you can't be in band and you can't be in orchestra because we can't afford an instrument. I think we work that from the personal side right now, but I think in terms of inventory, I don't think we're looking to be a one-to-one -one district because I don't think we can afford or support that. But what I do think is we'll never have an access issue because of affordability. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Horton. Thank you. Uh, I had a question about the deposit. Yes, ma'am. Um, for the the cleaning fee. Yes. So this is this is paid at like the start of a school year. Yes. And on average, like in a high school, how many instruments are checked out? That that I'll be honest with you and tell you, I'm not a hundred percent sure because I haven't seen all of their instrument checkout forms from this year yet. Um, they, that also should be accurately reflected in the CHARMS database, so we should be able to access that report pretty quickly. Um, and I, I'll be honest with you, I don't know. Um, I think it's typically the larger instruments that can't be transported back and forth to home, like large brass and woodwind instruments and percussion instruments. In the string world, it's string basses and cellos, things that you would not want taken back and forth each day to a student's home. So, um, to be really honest, I don't know a quantity or a number, but I think we could find that out. Um, okay, and then the the directors are collecting the the fee, the cleaning fee, and what it's like a parent writes a check or they it's, give them cash. Or? It it's it's either a, a documented process through the activity fund secretary at each campus, and I I. We'll be honest and tell you, yeah, I'm not. I can tell you how that. Please, I, was yeah. say, so I, I don't know. But it goes as a fee like every other fee, so we don't deal with cash, and we don't cash right. doesn't live in any in our classroom. So right. that's a fee that would go on a student's account. So every student has an account. So they, you know, it will show up band band maintenance fee seventy five dollars is going to show up on their student account, and the parents log into that account. That's where they would pay for that fee, and their National Honor Society fee, and their prom ticket, and their all the everything else that they would pay it it just shows up in their account and then, so then the activity fund secretary handles that transaction so we've gotten away from remote cash transactions throughout the building okay. yes and then i had another question for brian um so the band instrument audits this is performed in-house or this is something we refer out no this is internal okay thank you any other questions for Dr. Horton? Thank you, Dr. Horton. Thank you all. Thanks. Well, we have no questions at our meetings. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a fun good topic. Discussion. This is a good topic. <laughs> discussion. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Discussion. Well, the next slide will make you all happy. So, in conjunction with all this, we um, two weeks ago we performed a string instrument inventory, and part of the partnership is that you coordinate with each other and we were able working with dr horton to hit 13 schools in one week and do all these and get it knocked out um, with him coordinating and kind of leading the charge and internal audit behind actually you know doing the inventory um, so we went out and we counted uh, the string instruments only no bows no stands no chairs um, there were 960 instruments uh, listed on charms, and we only found five missing instruments out of all that. And we did add 28 instruments. Oh. <laughs> so um, 
that you know the result obviously much better and I, I think and I agree with Dr. Horton I, I think the word filtered down one of the good things about internal audit is people talk after you <laughs> audited and um, they say hey these people are thorough they're they're going to be checking this this and this and it makes people go bam maybe I need to check my terms inventory make sure you're we're, making a we're positive good. impact on the district yeah. so this turned out great um, and so um, again appreciate all of Dr. Horton's help on, on getting this done and getting it knocked out in a week I would assume a lot of this stuff is people finally getting serious about looking hard you know, yeah. you know if you're not being asked for it you kind of forget and yeah. oh well, I really got to find this and oh here it is no, I'm sure that's probably yeah, or, and just was. documenting properly. And documenting. Yeah. Really on the band side, it, it's it's a doc. I think it was a documentation issue much more than it was a instruments walking right. out issue. It's right. just they, things had fallen in disrepair and been replaced, but never got taken out of the inventory. It's on papers, so it's still sitting there, and you yep. just have to do a better job of getting back to the paperwork and making it yeah reality. reality. Yeah, at the end of the day, on the band instruments, it wasn't that they were walking away it was 20 years of no inventory i mean yeah. that's the bottom line yeah. yeah i don't think there's a black market out there for yeah. used high school <laughs> instruments i don't bet there would be probably <laughs> somewhat there's a, there's probably eight thousand dollar tuba yeah. <laughs> yeah i'm sure there's some market okay any other questions on string instruments band instruments Last slide is the 2021-2022 risk assessment. I will be sending that out in June. I, it's really important that I hear back from you all. Um, the audit committee, Dr. Noel and Darren, you all give me my marching orders. You tell me what, where you think the risk is, what you would like to see done. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's really critical that this, this process that you all participate in it. Um, I have streamlined it for my predecessor. It's 15 to 20 minutes at the most to complete. Um, it's pretty simple. So that will be coming out, like I said, around the middle of June. Mr. Hayden, have we ever, as the district, uh, put certain audit areas on any kind of a rotating audit schedule? Like we're going to every three years do this kind of an audit or every five years we want to make sure we do this kind of an audit. Yeah, I mean, we, we definitely, so payroll. Okay. Uh, purchasing okay. would be on there. So would all uh, those things be included in this risk assessment yes. that you're going to send us? So if, but, uh, if there'll this be a note says, saying, well, I want to make sure that, you know, whatever is audited so often and I have something different, we may each have a different focus yeah. uh, area that we consider important within the district. And it'd be nice to know from us as board members and audit member, audit committee members, that we know that every five years there's going to be a band instrument. I'm just making it up, but you know what I'm saying. I just want to make sure, because I know there's certain areas that are probably always, like you said, payroll is always going to be kind of a, a very big operating expense mm -hmm. and probably should have a higher risk uh, rating in there. Whether whether we have findings or not is, right. is immaterial. It's more about just the risk to the, the organization. Area. Right. Mm -hmm. And what so on that risk assessment, it'll say so purchasing audited in 2020. Okay, um, will be audited again, uh, 2023. Okay, so that information will be on the risk Perfect. assessment for you. Perfect. The other thing I would ask the audit committee, Dr. Noll, to think about is where you want to see internal audit in two years, five years. Um, over the last two years, we've, we've made some significant changes in internal audit. Um, but right now we're an operational financial internal audit. Do we want an IT function? Do we want an educational program function? I mean, that, those are the kind of questions that I look to you all to answer for, for down the road. Um, so that's just something to think about. The last item, this just came up um, after I sent in the deck. As you all know, the child nutrition audit um, was removed from the audit plan. And so we are going to replace it over the summer with a critical spreadsheet um, audit. And just to kind of give you a hint of what that is, think of all the Excel spreadsheets that we use for budgeting. 
for payroll, for purchasing, that determine you know, how we spend money. And these Excel spreadsheets, they have, some of them have complicated formulas and they have links and they have all these things. And so how are we making sure that those formulas and those links are secure and they're, they're audited on, on a regular basis? Make sure the formula is still correct, that that link's not broken. Who has access to that Excel spreadsheet? So those types of issues are what we'll be looking at. And actually, it's a perfect summer um, audit. It's all here. Um, so that's what we'll be doing over the summers working on that. Mr. Hayden and I had a discussion about that a couple of weeks ago, I guess. What we're really looking at is model validation. Any any kind of direct model that we're using with Excel spreadsheets or things like that, and then we use those for estimating values for certain things, mm -hmm. or and that can be in a variety of different areas within the district. We just need to make sure that whatever formulas, like Mr. Hayden said, that we're using, that there hasn't been a break in the in the chain somewhere, and that that is still accurate. And I think that that would help us out. We also, from my perspective, and I've been on the board 11 years now, I don't know how many we have. And so it would be a good idea just to know, you know, because sometimes when you're doing this model validation, you can find out, well, we have a software program that we, you know, purchased as a part of a bigger package that we've never utilized. And so there may be some, some process improvements that we can create through doing this as well. The other thing, I mean, I've done this out in the corporate world for SOX. Um, yes. You also find redundancies. Yeah, absolutely, you find that. So right. you see these three, two three spreadsheets. are doing the same thing. Right, right. they're doing the right. exact same thing. Yeah. So if three you different have, ways. <laughs> you have this master list of what we'll call critical spreadsheets, and those are the ones used in making key business decisions. Um, mm -hmm. And, yeah, I'm with Chairman Sanders. I think it's important for us to know what's out there, just like the band instruments. I mean, we need to have an accurate inventory of those, those critical spreadsheets. Any questions? I got a quick question for you. Remind me, as far as auditing um, clubs, because I know we have no jurisdiction over clubs, but I, I, I thought I had remembered at some point in the last six years that we said that we offer auditing to the, you know, like the, the band club or the, all of the different clubs that have, even though they're not part of CISD, so they can sometimes be a reflection of us if they ever get in trouble or get caught because we're kind of tied to it. Do we can still offer some type of auditing help or, or, or accounting help or any jurisdiction to help them with, with what do they do? We offer um, help. We don't do audits of them, but they call us and ask questions about taxes and, you know, working with the, the state and the IRS and all that. And so we, we provide guidance on all that. We, we have seminars um, for the clubs that go over all those issues like, you know, the taxes and sales tax and all that. So we do work closely with them. And my admin, Laura, is the one that, that's the, the point person for that. Okay. So yeah, we, we do offer help. We don't do any record keeping. Or we don't do at any all. direct auditing. No. Don't we still have some clubs that are not set up under our um, umbrella tax exemption? Like, don't we still have a few booster clubs that have some have their own tax ID? Yes, yeah. yeah. that's correct. Right. Yeah. It, now the every booster club that functions, they do function separately, but it is an expectation that they provide annually to the principal um, their financials. So there is that level of oversight on the campus. Now, truthfully, the you know, principals aren't the same financial expert that Mr. Hayden is, but it, it does provide that question and answer opportunity um, to make sure things are going straight. So that'd be like PTO or, or the booster clubs, any of those things that sort of function as not us, but affiliated with us. Gotcha. And I know as a nonprofit, they, I know you assist with helping them understand the 990s and mm -hmm. the, the, the understanding of designating a, a treasurer that can provide that information to their board. Correct. Right. Great thank questions. You. Anything else? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank I you. will okay. see you all in September. <laughs> all right. I think our next audit committee meeting will be scheduled for September. Do we have an exact date? I don't know that we have. Okay. 
Do we want to set that now or maybe we sure just can. okay? Second Wednesday, right? That's the typically eighth? a Wednesday. The eighth, September eighth. Yes, that would that would make. Uh, I believe there's a principal meeting. There is a principal schedule. meeting that day. Um, would Would anyone have an issue if we did it on the seventh? Just for that month to have it on a Tuesday instead of a Wednesday. Uh, I think that's okay. That's the, that'd be the Tuesday after the Labor Day. It would. Holiday. Yes. Yeah. That's okay. Any I'm objections to that? All right. We'll go ahead and set September the 7th, 2021, 7.30 a.m. as our next audit committee meeting. Any other discussion items not on our agenda? I think so. All right.